Hey friends, welcome to this conversation. That's a very, very important topic that's near and dear to my heart. I just want to say if you've ever felt bullied, abused, or unable to speak up for yourself with doctors or with medical professionals, then this video and this conversation is for you. So in this conversation, my friend Samantha and I talk about self-advocacy in a medical setting. I have a deep respect for Western medicine and what it can do for us at a certain point in time. And I even believe that Western medicine saved my life at a certain point in my journey, but it's also hurt me. I've felt bullied and even traumatized by certain scenarios that registered to my body as being violated. And I'm sure that I'm not alone in this. In a space that should be for compassion, sensitivity, and healing, this is simply not okay. I believe that there's a need for a much deeper level of sensitivity and honoring of each of our innate wisdom as the only ones that are inhabiting our own bodies. We are not dumb and we are not less than doctors or medical staff, and we should all be working together. So in today's conversation, we talk about how to advocate for yourself with medical staff, with doctors, and in a Western medical setting, how to take your power back in these situations, and how to remember that these people are actually working for you and serving you. I even share a very personal and vulnerable story of a time when I was unable to advocate for myself and felt very violated. This is a very tender and sensitive topic, but it's a really, really important one if we want to begin to create and encourage a healthcare system that honors us as empowered individuals and sensitive beings. So thank you for watching and let's get into it. Hey everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel or my podcast or wherever you're listening from. My name is Erin McMurtry and I'm a health coach and a home herbalist. And today we're talking with my friend, Samantha, who, if you listen to the podcast, she was on episode eight of the Real Herbalist podcast. And today we are talking about a topic that we're both super passionate about, and that is advocacy or self-advocacy in terms of Western medicine or being in a Western medicine space and advocating for yourself and how important that is and how a lot of times we just think that because the Western medicine doctors are like the authority or they're set up to be the authority that we have to just do whatever we're told. It's like a hierarchical setup that we kind of walk into in the Western medicine uh, model. So anyways, thank you for being here, Samantha. Super excited to share with you or to talk with you about this topic. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I know this is one that we are both very passionate on and we've learned a lot through our own personal journeys. One of the reasons that this conversation was kind of sparked was because I'm, I've witnessed a lot of my family members go through things for many years, which is between that and my own personal journey, why I have the take that I have. But even within these last few months, um, grandparents in and out of hospitals passing away and seeing them not really know how to have conversations with um, doctors, with medical staff, and to advocate for themselves. It's not an easy skill to learn to stand up for yourself when you feel inferior. Um, and it, oftentimes in those situations, you do feel a little bit inferior. They might not be intending to make you feel that way, but you just don't feel like I know all the things, right? So you just feel like I just don't know, so I shouldn't step in. And so it's so much harder to start to learn that in your 80s when you're not feeling good, when so many of your bodily systems are going awry. And so the earlier that we can learn these conversations, how to advocate for ourselves, I just think it's so important. Yes. Oh my gosh. It's so true. And I think one of the important things to note, and one of the things that I, I want to say at the forefront of this conversation is that we all know our bodies better than anybody else. Like you are inside your body, nobody else, nobody else knows what it's like to be in your body. And so for me, that is something that I really desire that I, I desire to be honored in my relationship with doctors and Western medicine and professionals in general. And I find that it really isn't, or it hasn't been in my experience. So I just want to sort of like place that in as one of the pillars, at least for me to say to you, the listener is like, 
remember that no one else is in your body. No one else knows what it's like to be in your body. And if you're feeling something or you know something is off or you know something isn't, isn't right for you, to remember that no one can supersede that knowing. And I guess the other thing that I would just say right at the top of this conversation is doctors in Western medicine, A, they're not taught this in school. They're not taught how to really ask deep questions. They're not taught how to understand. They're taught how to recognize patterns and how to look at symptoms and how to mediate different drug interactions with each other. Like that is really where the focus is. It's not on really understanding the person as a whole. Um, and then they don't, they're not given the time a lot of the times from the insurance company aspect. So there's those two factors that are at play that kind of limit, right? A lot of doctors are very well intentioned, have good hearts. They want to help, but when they get into the system, they kind of feel like their hands are tied, that they don't have the time and they're just trying to move through it. And the more that we can learn to advocate, to stand up for ourselves, to say, hey, wait a second, what about this? Um, we start to help shift some of their minds, their perspectives, how they provide care. And the more and more of those people change, it's similar to how 10 years ago, there was like barely any gluten and dairy free products out there. But the more that awareness built, the more people that started demanding them, that started paying for them, that paid $7 for bread before it dropped a little bit, um, that's how we start to get the conversation to change and to get the actual systems to change. Yeah. Awesome. Great point. And can you share, so before we started recording, you shared about uh, your client who didn't realize that she could make certain requests at the doctor's office. And so this is something that is a super simple example of something that may even seem small or insignificant, but could also be something that could really trigger someone. So I'd love for you to share that example because I think it's really applicable for people. When people go into the doctor's offices, they have all those mental stories of, oh no, they're going to judge me. They're going to do this. I don't know how I feel about this. Like there's just so much internal talk and like that stress goes up going in. And so one of the big things for my one client was that knowing her weight isn't where it should be, knowing that it's been a past conversation at the doctor's office and knowing that she's still kind of in that same space and she doesn't want to feel shamed or judged that she hasn't made this massive, huge improvement when she's like, I already know these things. I've been trying to make changes, but I'm just not there yet. I don't need you to read like what's going on there. And so it was, she was like, oh, I just don't know. And I was like, well, do you know that you can ask them not to tell you what your weight is and so they can still gather the data that they need to collect at the appointment but that you don't have to feel any certain way around it and so whether that's you know stepping on and closing your eyes and them not telling you the number stepping on backwards whatever it is that you feel comfortable with but it's like one simple request like that versus like walking in the door and I I have to do whatever you say it's like releasing that mentality to how do we co-partner in this? Like what would feel good for me, but still honoring that you need certain information from me. And then one other simple one when you go in is instead of them taking your blood pressure, the second that you get in the door, it's like, you know, can I have five, 10 minutes or can we take my blood pressure at the end of my appointment when I've had a moment to sit here and breathe and like get my bearings again? Yeah, I love that, especially because the weight thing can be very, very triggering for a lot of people and put put people into a shame spiral and even not even like be a, a helpful metric for somebody who's in that space. So I love that example. And something else that I want to share from recent experience, because I went to a doctor's appointment last week, is this new way that they take your temperature by like pointing this temperature gun at your head. Like I didn't realize that was coming and it was very startling for someone like, like me, who's very sensitive to energy to have this like gun looking thing, just like all of a sudden pointed at my head without any like warning, like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to like take your temperature. This is what I'm going to do. Like just really realizing that there's not a whole lot of sensitivity in the space. And so if you are somebody who is very sensitive to things like that, then it is going to be up to you, like you said, until the systems change to be more sensitive, it's up to you to make requests like that for whatever it is that you need in the space. So um, yeah, the whole temperature gun thing is, is not my favorite. I personally um, just like it, it feels a little invasive. 
to me. So, yeah. And that really speaks to only, you know, your own body, you know, like, how sensitive you are. And I, I too am very sensitive. And if you think about their profession, they have to be desensitized. They have to be like in order to be in that profession, they can be the most caring, compassionate person. And still they have to create a line of separation in order to do their job and to handle the amount of energy and emotions that they have to witness each day. And they have to witness some really tough things. And so if you know you're really sensitive going into an area where people are desensitized, they're having to do these procedures, it's just part of their job. They don't even think about it to take that moment to pause and be like, you know, before we get into different things, will you please just walk me through what it is you're going to do it before you do it? And I think part of self-advocacy too is realizing that sometimes they won't honor it. Realizing that sometimes they might hear you, but not listen, right? They're so in their process of what what other patients do I got to get to that day? They might not fully hear you and they might not honor it in that moment. And most will. So, But I just want to always add that air of like, if they don't honor it in that moment, like don't take that as the, oh, I'm not allowed to advocate for myself. I can't do it here. Maybe that's not the right fit place for you and you get to keep exploring other options. But just because one person might not honor it doesn't mean that you have to stop asking. Good point. And you also have the choice, I would imagine, to choose another provider, like you said, to find somebody else who does feel like a better fit and who does align more and is more sensitive to your requests. For me, where this really showed up was, and many of you who have been around have heard my story. I had uh, was diagnosed with some digestive autoimmune stuff around 2015. And sort of the narrative that I was offered was like, this is what's going on. You're going to be dealing with this for the rest of your life. There's no way to heal this or get rid of this or do anything about it aside from just give you these drugs. And so like, this is just kind of what you're going to be living with now. And when our minds believe something that our brains literally sort for evidence and create evidence to support that belief. And we also act in alignment with that belief. Right. And so for me, it was such a huge moment of realizing like, no, that doesn't actually feel right for me. And I'm not going to take that on. And no, like I, I'm not accepting that as my, just my ultimate diagnosis. And this is going to be my life. Like that doesn't align for me. I think it's such a, a shame that, you know, like you said, doctors are trained in sort of this one area of like diagnosis and drugs and other things, but they're not really trained in, um, nutrition right? I think they have like a very small amount of training in nutrition, which is just crazy because nutrition is such a huge part of our health. And they're not really trained in the power of suggestion, the power of your words, the power of how you speak to somebody, telling somebody that they're never going to heal from something is very, very, uh, I I mean, telling someone that they're never going to heal is one of the most effed up things that I can ever imagine saying to anybody because you're basically just taking away their hope. Right. And so for me, luckily I've done enough work to know the power of my belief, to know the, understand the power of suggestion and to really feel my own truth within that, which was, this is not my truth. This is not for me. That's just something that's very near and dear to my heart. And I just want to share that is that if you're somebody who is, you're looking to heal from something and you've been told that you know, you're never going to get there or things are never going to get better or whatever, or anything, right? If you've been told anything and you can feel the yuck in your body of, Ooh, I, that is not true for me. And you may not even identify that as what that is, but to just really realize that they're coming from a very limited and non-holistic perspective of healing. And that just because someone says something to you, and that, that is a perceived authority does not mean it is ultimate truth, right? There are so many things that doctors can't explain that have happened, spontaneous healings and such. So just to really be aware too of what you're taking in from 
these professionals, authorities. And so I just want to remind you too, that it may not even necessarily be something that you're like requesting out loud, but just to remember to keep that, um, that d- discernment detector on within yourself, because they're just coming from one perspective and that may not actually be a true perspective for you. You get to decide, right? Like this is your body. Does that feel true to you? If it's a no, then that's okay. Like Mm -hmm. to remember to keep that on that level of discernment on and to not just hand over your power to somebody who doesn't know you, doesn't know your life, doesn't know what you're capable of, et cetera, et cetera. So you're the authority on your body. (laughs) No one else. You know, I think the conversation that you're sharing, I think it applies even beyond Western medicine into all areas of our life, because I know we've probably each met people and you listening have met people or you've been this person where you've been told different messages from parents, siblings, teachers, um, all these boyfriends, girlfriends, like all these people around you who said like, oh, that business idea is not going to work out. Why should you even try that? And they try to put their beliefs onto you. And you're like, no, I really want to do this thing. Like, why are you you getting on my vibe, man? (laughs) Um, And they're trying to convince you that their way of thinking and looking at the world is the right way. And while it might be a part of it, like something within you is telling you like, no, I really want to do this other thing. Um, And so that discernment, it applies to all areas of our life. Um, And that's where you get to flex the muscle in all these other areas, but it 100% applies to your body, your health when you're in um, these different situations. And if you don't know my story and journey either, um, that's where I felt like that hope was taken from me because I um, was 13 years old when it, my body was completely full of inflammation. They had no idea where it was coming from. The most tender touch could send me into tears. And I was a competitive gymnast. I trained 20, 25 hours a week. So to go from being so able in my body to then overnight not, and then them literally tell me like, you just have to learn how to live with this. I didn't want to learn how to live with it. I was 13. I already felt like I was 80. And I'm so grateful that I was a very stubborn teenager and was just like, I mean, I believed that for a long time and I felt the light was going out at the end of the tunnel and I was on the edge of suicide and considering it. And then once I was right at that edge and I was about like, not about to, but really contemplating it, I had that soft knowing that was like, no, you're not meant to do this. You have no idea how it's going to get better, but you need to stay. And so the more that you can connect to and listen to that really soft inner whisper, it is always there, but it is the softest whisper until you start to really listen and develop that connection with your intuition, um, and then it will start to scream at you. <laughs> but until then, it's the softest little whisper um, that you need to start to learn how to listen to. But yeah, there's so many different times. I remember I went to a gynecologist one time, and I had already waited like 40 minutes in her office. Um, well past like when my appointment time was all the things and then she came in and she was with me for like five minutes I had told her that I was clotting a lot more than normal on my cycle and it just something didn't feel right and she just would not listen to me it was my first time ever having an appointment with her and she gave me a prescription by the time that I was ready to leave and I was like okay so I took the prescription. I never filled it. I didn't do anything with it because I was like, you never took time to really listen to me, to understand my background, to understand different factors, to educate me about why my body might be doing this and what it might be trying to tell me. You just saw like, here it is. Here's your thing. I did my job and I'm on to the next room. And that with everything that I had been through with my health at that point, personally was not good enough for me. And I just chose not to take her opinion as fact um, and to simply just like put it in the little filing cabinet. Okay, I did that. I got curious. I took in the information from this professional. I'm now going to go find another professional. Yeah. And it takes a lot of like just determination to really know like yourself and it takes a lot of trust in yourself and I think for me, like, yeah, I don't know. I've just always kind of been that like person. That's just like, I 
I can feel like what's my truth and what isn't. And I'd say for people that maybe don't feel as connected to that, what I would offer, and I'd love to hear if you have any thoughts on that is to really like get quiet with yourself, to really calm yourself down, to see if you can get into a place where you're like calm and quiet and just tap into like the inner truth or the truth from source or whatever feels best for you. But it's really hard to tune into that truth. I feel like when we're, um, when we're really stressed or when our mind is going, 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 uh, for me, it's easier to access that if I'm having trouble in more of a calm state. So yeah, curious if you have any thoughts on that. Mm, No, that's 100% true. It's like, you need to be um, when you're first learning to tap into it, it's like getting into a, a like a Zen state. Cause when you are, uh, in your head, you're swirling, you're spinning, you're chaotic. It's like, you might be able to f- hear like a semblance of it, but then it's like whoosh and another thought. And it's like, Whoa. Okay. But the other thing that was kind of coming to mind, like how to start to flex that is honoring your yes and no. Um, in all areas of your life and really tuning into that. Do I want to go out to eat tonight or do I want to stay in? Do I want to go see a movie or do I want to read a book? And you may be like, how in the hell does that relate to being able to stand up to myself in front of a doctor? I used to be the most indecisive person (laughs) and it was like, oh, let's go out to eat. Where do you want to go? I don't care wherever you want to go. And I would not make a decision. I would not tune in to what did I actually want. I just wanted to do what anyone else wanted to do. So that way everybody else was happy around me. But I was never tuning into what do I actually want. And so that's where I say that's a helpful exercise to start to tune into it because you're learning to tune in and decide what is it that I want? What is it that will feel good for me in this moment? Um, Do I need to drink a glass of water? or Do I need to go take a nap? Like what is it that's going to help me right now? What you can do is you can start with really simple questions like that. Do I want to go to pizza? Do I want to go to Chinese food? I don't know. Just like giving yourself two options and feeling between them and feeling what feels expansive. Like, does one feel like the energy is expanding? Does one feel like the energy is contracting? Does one feel light? Does one feel heavy? Like just sort of noticing the sensations of, you know, when you ask yourself questions, it's a really great way to practice. And I actually have an experiential video on my YouTube that I think is called how to talk to your body experiential. And I guide you through a practice just like that. Another one that you can play with is a question that you already know the answer to. And like, you know, my name is Aaron. Okay. That feels like open, light, and expansive. My name is Joe. Like that feels downward. And it does, you know, like I can feel it's, it's subtle, but the more you practice it, the more you'll get comfortable with it. And especially starting with questions you already know the answer to, you know, which one's true. So like, Oh, that's what true feels like. Oh, that's what false feels like. So yeah, just a, just a little tidbit of a way that you can start practicing that if you feel maybe disconnected from your truth and you're not sure where to start. That's a good place to start. It's scary to start to stand up to someone who seems like the perceived expert, but to keep in your mind that they're the perceived expert in the journey that they've walked. They don't know everything. Yeah. Yeah but they know a lot of things. And so I always take what they're telling me with like, I'm not blocked off to what they have to tell me. Um, but I don't take it as this is what I have to do. Um, it's like, okay, how can I pair this with how I want to walk this journey? Um, and one of the other examples that comes to mind is uh, I have another client who, um, is, really needing to do like some diabetes care and management and the idea of doing a really rigid and restrictive diet where it's like celery and cucumber she's like oh like can't do it won't do it right so you might go to a professional that is an expert in diabetes care and reversal for like type 2 diabetes they might want to do it in a way that you just know you won't follow through with and so it's like okay how can I take what they're telling me understand how that's affecting my body and then how can I work it in a way where I'm actually going to follow through with this not just for a month but for the rest of my life and like finding a way that feels good for you to honor yourself your lifestyle because that's another big part that um 
they don't take into consideration is what is your lifestyle and do you want to change your lifestyle? Some people do. Like my lifestyle really, I wouldn't say at 180, like I was always like a healthy person, but then I had to make choices that the other people around me weren't making. And so I was willing to shift my lifestyle because I could see how our food was creating more inflammation in my body. And so I had to go gluten and dairy free to do that. And everyone around me, like every meal, every um, outing, it was always like, well, what can Sam eat? And it would have just been easier to be like, it's all right, guys, I'll find something. If I have a little bit of gluten tonight, it's okay. It's like, it wasn't okay. I couldn't do those things. It was going to really impact not only my physical body, but my mental health. Gluten can really exacerbate depression, anxiety symptoms. Um, and so it's like, doctors don't really take into account, like, what is your lifestyle? Are you a salesperson? who travels five days a week and you're in and out of airports. Okay, if I tell you to change your diet, will you know what to look for at an airport, like, quick stop? <laughs> like, maybe not. Like, so they, I love that because one of the things that I, people often ask me when I tell them that I'm a health coach, they're like, well, what exactly is that? And as I start explaining it, and they're like, oh, I was at my doctor's and they told me to change my diet and stuff, but that was it. And I didn't really know what to do with it past that. I'm like, yeah. So I play the bridge and I help take their recommendations and help you actually figure out how to implement them in your life. And they're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. That's why what we do is so important because yeah, they, they don't know your body, but they also don't know your life. And once you leave there, it's up to you to do all these things. So it's another great example of the discernment of like, what is actually going to work for you? Like your client, she knows that's, I'm not going to do that. Like, I'm just not. So we might as well find a way to create this so that I can actually be successful. I think that's really great advice for people too, who are looking to find, create any kind of lifestyle or diet or exercise changes, like know yourself, know what's, what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And if someone's offering you something that you know doesn't work for you, then that's not for you. I just, I had athlete's foot. I don't know how I got it, but it had gotten, as soon as the weather turned, it like went from like zero to 60. And I was like, Oh, I, I really don't want to go to the doctor for this, but like, are my essential oils enough to mm. do this? Right. There's always that like line of fear of, I want to treat this myself, but what if I don't do it in the right capacity and it gets out of hand, right? So I feel like there's always that because when we are advocating for ourselves, we're choosing to really trust ourselves to go with the path that we feel most comfortable with in handling our body throughout that journey. But there is a lot of trust and responsibility that falls back on us for being willing to take that on because when we give our power away, we kind of we kind of give the responsibility away. I'm curious, like throughout your journey of really having to go inward and say like, okay, you're telling me this. Okay. And here's this. Okay. I'm going to choose this. Like, what did you really draw on to help you trust yourself in those decisions? I think Western medicine has its place, right? And there are things that it's really, really good at. Subtlety is not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> like when there's a subtle issue, I feel like their solution is to like hit it with a Mack truck. For me, I'd rather attempt to work on something myself with diet and lifestyle and herbs and rest, which I mean is cannot be understated the importance of rest, right? I'd rather like exhaust all of those options before taking pharmaceutical medication or going to like surgery or whatever. Right. And so I think we all have to find our, our line of where that feels good for us. I've just never been a big medication person. I mean, of course, if I'm like really sick, like I said, you know, if I'm really sick, like I had bronchitis when I was little, yeah, I was taking medication for that. I've had strep throat before really bad. Yeah. I'm taking friggin' medication for that. But for me, like I want to exhaust all of my other options first. And I did that. And I actually, you know, it was a lot of work, you know, it wasn't necessarily the easy path and it took time. That's the thing too, is, you know, 
So I was, I had, you know, intense symptoms. I was, had blood in my bowel movements every day. I was going diarrhea multiple times a day. I had pain in my abdomen, but I did. Um, and I went to a naturopathic doctor and an iridologist, and she put me on a strict, no sugar, no alcohol, like no inflammatory foods diet. I was doing, um, bentonite clay, which is a detoxifier. Uh, I was taking a lot of supplements. What? Were you drinking the clay? Yeah. I was drinking it in the morning, in the evening. I was doing a lot of herbal supplements. And after I'd say two or three weeks, my symptoms started, I started noticing them go way down, which was huge because I was really uncomfortable. (laughs) Um, And that really worked for me. And I was like, I had, after three weeks, I had the evidence that I didn't need to go to Western medicine, you know? And then a couple months later, once I stopped uh, doing all of those things and started kind of eating again or not eating again, but like, you know, eating more loosely, having more sugar, drinking alcohol, probably six months after I had fully healed, it started to come back. And I didn't really want to do all the things I had done. I didn't want to restrict my diet again. So I just didn't. And it came back and it came back and I didn't do the things I knew I needed to do. And I let it get so bad to the point where none of those things were going to help. Like I, I just let it go. I let it get bad again. And at that point I had to go to the emergency room and I was in the hospital for several days and, um, you know, got the steroids and all the things I almost had to have a blood transfusion. So I think my long-winded answer to your question is like, for me, Western medicine has a lot of amazing options when you're in an emergency or when something is really, really bad. Um, for me, that's when I have found that they're the most helpful. You know, I have my own line, right? I think that's the thing. We have to find our own line with it. Um, but for me, that's what it's been is like, do I have the space and energy to really look at, like to exhaust all my other options? And at that point, you know, it had gotten so bad for me that I was at the point where I needed an emergent solution. Mm -hmm. That's a really key point that you just stated. Do I have the space and energy to do this? Because when you take on being your own advocate, really you're taking ownership of being the healer in your own life because there's so many habits and daily things that we can do to help heal our body. And I say that from the standpoint that, our body is always healing itself on its own without us stepping in. It's always trying to clean, repair, heal, build, um, and do those things. But when different uh, chemicals or irritants, inflammatory foods, chemicals, products, like all of these things come in, it puts more and more burden on our body and it makes it harder for our body to heal itself. And one of the best examples is when you cut yourself, you might put a band-aid on, you put put a little bit of neosporin on, but for the most part, your body heals itself. If you cut a steak in your fridge, it's not going to heal itself, right? It needs that life force energy through it. And I know that's one of the things that I really lean on and trust when my body is going really through it. I trust that my body knows what to do and I simply have to listen and get curious and really just keep saying like well is this what you want is this what you want is this what you want but if you don't have the space or the energy to really be in that place and observing all of the different things then that is where you might want some other um, support to step in whether that is a more natural practitioner who can take some of that weight off of you and like you had said at the start, like somebody who's going to honor my body in the way that I want it taken care of. Or you might be in that emergency situation and agreed, like Western med, like that is what Western medicine is for, is emergency situations. When we kind of leap off the edge of our health, they kind of grab us and pull us back to a point where our body stabilizes enough that they can discharge us But then from the discharge, it's up to us to decide, like, how am I choosing to take care of myself? Is it with the medication and I want to supplement other practices? Um, Depending on what it's, what you have, it's like, okay, maybe I don't actually need the medication. It might not be as dire. So I'm going to choose to forgo that and really lean into these, right? Like you get to weigh like how much of each 
what is my line that I want to carry each of them for? I'd say that's kind of how you be your own best advocate is being ready to pull in other resources, but also being really in tune with your body and and the path of how you want your body treated the 90% of the time. Mm. Yes. Oh my gosh. So much came up when you were sharing that. One of the things I wanted to add was like weighing the cost of using Western medicine, for example, like antibiotics, right? Like if you have something that they want to give you antibiotics for like, okay, do I want to take the extra energy to try to heal this naturally? Or do I want to use antibiotics, which might be quicker, but then it's going to bomb my gut and kill all the good bacteria in my gut. And then I'm going to have to build my gut back up. So it's like a lot of times their solutions or pharmaceuticals or things have other impacts that we're going to have to deal with that down the road. So it's like, that's another thing to consider too, that I just wanted to throw in there. Um, I love that example that you gave and like juggling the two, because for me, I have gone through, like with my healing journey, I've gone through the natural path and it worked and I've gone through the Western medicine path and that worked too. And so for me, it really has been like, I've, I've gone on both sides of the road. And um, so I have just like, I think I have a unique perspective of really honoring the place of both of them. But one thing I wanted to share, um, was that when, like I mentioned, I had gone into the hospital to help with colitis and they gave me steroids and they put me on that medication that they initially wanted to put me on before when I had cured it with natural remedy. And, um, so I was on that for a while and they wanted me to stay on it for like two years, I think. Um, and so I was on it, you know, cause I had been really not well. Um, and I stayed on it for a while and it felt good and it felt right. But then all of a sudden I noticed like maybe a year, a year and a half in, I noticed that I would forget to take it mm-hmm. and like that taking it just didn't, I could just feel like it, it wasn't, I didn't need to take it anymore. Like I just felt it in my own system before, like I could feel that it was helping and then I wanted it and then it felt in alignment and then I just would forget. And for me, that felt like, oh, my system is not like requesting that anymore. And I stopped taking it and I actually got on a high dose probiotic that helped even more than the medication was helping. And at that point, my body was ready to release the medication and was ready for something even better than that, which was like, addressing the actual issue. So, um, obviously I'm not telling anybody to get off medications, but, um, or to stop taking medications. Cause I don't know what, you know, you're going through, but for me, I could just tell when my body was like, okay, I'm good with that. Like, you know, there was a place for it for a minute, for a hot minute <laughs> per year or whatever it was. And then I was done. And so I just trusted, you know, my own journey with that. So just sharing that. Well, I think that's, what's so challenging about this conversation and why it's hard to have in a generalized capacity because it's so individualized like in this conversation we can't say this is the right way to do it because that might not be true for you um there's so many factors and layers to take into account um that you know you just can't address without seeing or talking to someone so like whatever you're hearing from us you take what we're saying in with a grain of salt and with your journey you know this might be a brand new conversation a brand new perspective you grew up in a completely conventional house with always going to the doctor for every sniffle always having a full medicine cabinet of advil tylenol like uh tums like all the things and like this conversation is like whoa this is totally new so baby step your way into it um but i think that's one of the reasons why this is such a challenging conversation to have is because it is so individualized yes yeah absolutely um curious if you have any stories of specific times when maybe you didn't advocate for yourself or did advocate for yourself that you feel like would be helpful to share with people? So one time that comes, one of the earliest times that I started advocating for myself was when I was 15. And I, uh, so when I was 12 was when all the things started happening with my body and inflammation. And then by the time I was 
13-ish. Um, I had gone through all the tests, all the doctors, all the professionals, and they just didn't have answers for me. So during that time period, I'd say I didn't advocate for myself. Um, I was just hoping they knew they were the experts. I was really trusting them. And that's where at the end of that journey, when they still didn't have any answers for me and they're just like, well, I hope it gets better for you. And if not, like you got to learn how to live with this. Um, I felt like that hope was taken from me and I was P.O.'d. I was angrier than angry because I'm like, you're supposed to have the answers. You know all the information. You're the expert. You're the trained professional. You're all these things. And I was angry because you're you're leaving me on my own as this like teenager who knows nothing about herself yet, the world, like all of these things and to just like figure it out. And um, so I was really angry and I didn't really advocate for myself at that point because I simply didn't know how to. So then fast forward like two years, I had so much anxiety. I was heavily depressed. I had a really hard time coming out of it. Yet at the same time, I was trying to be okay on the surface for everybody else around me. And so I had asked to go to therapy. Um, which in a way was advocating for myself because that was not uh, something that we did in our household, talk about emotions, therapy. My mom was like, well, why can't you just talk to me? Why can't you just talk to a friend? Um, so it wasn't really understood. And so that was a really scary way of beginning to advocate for myself, even within my with my parents at that time. But then I got into therapy and I went to this one psychiatrist and um, I don't remember if it was after the first or the second visit but early on um, she wanted to give me antidepressants and so I didn't really feel good about it because I knew that I had just been through really intense things out of the blue that nobody could have prepared me for and I didn't know how to process it I didn't know how to make sense of it um, I didn't really feel like I needed medication for it. I just needed to understand, like, why is all of this happening? And so I didn't really want to take it, and I told her it. And she's like, well, you know, just go take it, and we'll see how you feel on your next appointment. So I was like, okay. So I left, got the script filled. Um, I think I took it for one day, and everything in my body was just like, no, <laughs> I don't want to do this. And so I went back to her on the next visit and I told her I took it for a day and I just, I didn't really feel like myself. I don't want to take this. And she started yelling at me. And so that's where, when I say, if you advocate for yourself and your professional <laughs> doesn't really honor it, wow. you, you still get to choose yourself and the path that is like, feels so deeply true within you. Um, and so she started to tell me how she knew better, how she took the same boards as neurologists and that I just didn't know. And I, I never went back to her after that. Good. I was like, I'm not going back to you. Like, you're not, you're not saying, okay, let's look at a different path forward. You're telling me this is the only path forward and that I'm bad and wrong and you know better. And that just didn't fly with me, uh, even at that age. And I'm so grateful that I had that. Wow. That's really, really wise for a 15 year old, a 13 year old. Like that's, I'm like really impressed with you. That's amazing. And so cool. I'm just so grateful that I really stood up for myself yeah, it's probably one of the most important times to advocate for yourself and one of the most hard, I mean, one of the most difficult because not only is your doctor the authority, but your parents are the authority. It's like you are t like basically a tiny human in this world of authority. And I mean, that's how I felt anyway. So I can imagine how um, challenging <laughs> that would be for, for someone who's that young, which is why I just like, I'm like, little Samantha, go you. Like, I want to give her a high five. <laughs> That's so awesome. Yeah. When I was thinking about this conversation, about having this conversation with you, I, I have a specific memory, um, for myself that I wish I would have advocated for. And I'd love to share that even though it's quite vulnerable, but, um, early on in my journey before I had gotten diagnosed, my doctor, you know, said, okay, you know, even though you're having all this like blood in your stool and diarrhea all the time, like we're really not concerned about colitis or Crohn's disease until you have abdominal pain. So if you have, if you develop abdominal pain, 
call us and, you know, come in. Like two days later, I started getting abdominal pain. <laughs> so I called and they were like, oh, you know, we can see you in like a month or something. And I was like, no, you're going to see me in the next 48 hours. So that was, that was actually, I did advocate for myself there. I told her, this is an emergency. You're going to get me in ASAP because this is not good. Right. So they did get me in. There you go, guys. You can, you can do that. Anyway, so they got me in and, you know, my doctor came into the room and I told him, you know, I am starting to have abdominal pain. So I am concerned that this is something more intense because before they were telling me it was just like hemorrhoids or something. And I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure this is like more than hemorrhoids. So anyways, so I tell him that I have abdominal pain and literally as soon as I said that it set off this like motion of events. And I was just like, what is happening? So immediately after I said that he like calls in the nurse, he says, you know, bring in the, bring in the cart or whatever, bring in the nurse. And he said, we're going to, you know, we're going to look basically at my butthole. <laughs> and so all of a sudden I'm like, wait, what's happening? Nurses are rolling this like cart in and he tells me to turn around and like lay on my stomach because they're going to stick like a scope up my anus. There was no like, Hey, are you okay? Like, Hey, are you ready? Like, we're going to, we're going to look now, like no acknowledgement of this being like one of the most vulnerable experiences moments of my whole life. And I just felt like it was like happening to me. You know, like, and in the moment, I wish I would have said like, Hey, I feel like, like, cause I started crying as this all started, this frenzy of activity started happening. And I was just like, what the fuck? These people are going to look at my butthole right now. This is like so terrifying. And, um, I wish I would have said like, Hey, everybody just like slow down. I need a moment to just like cry and like process what's about to happen. Like, what are you going to do exactly? You know, and just like, I just need a second to breathe, but I didn't do that. <laughs> and, um, I just basically let them take over my body, which in a way felt like being raped. Um, which I, I know other people who have had experiences with even getting, um, like pap smears, uh, a good friend of mine shared that she felt like she was being raped in that, um, in that experience, because there's, there was no really like sensitivity or consent or like gentleness or any just acknowledgement of the vulnerability of the, you know, of the moment. And th these are our bodies. Like we're, it, it is, it's very vulnerable and it's just, it's so sad and unfortunate that, like you said, the way that the system is set up, they do have to like almost, I mean, they don't, I don't think they have to, I think there's obviously a better way, but maybe in the, the way the system is set up, they do have to sort of desensitize themselves in a way. But my hope and desire is that, you know, for the future of, of medicine and healthcare is that we find ways to honor people, people's bodies, people's sacred vessels, you know, and like, if we're going to come into their space, there's like an acknowledgement of like, Hey, are you okay? Like, may I proceed, mm -hmm. you know, and just having that respect for each other as human beings, as sensitive beings who, you know, have a lot of stuff around our bodies too. It's like, there's a lot of emotional intensity. Like what if somebody actually did was sexually assaulted in that way? And then you just recreated that scenario for them. Like our, this is why understanding health as a holistic thing is like so important because it's not just, you know, our, my digestive system is not completely separate from my emotional system, right? It's like all of these things are connected. And that was a very traumatizing experience for me. And I left that kind of just being like, whoa, like, am I in my body right now? What just happened? Did I just get like assaulted? I mean, I know in my head, I wasn't assaulted, but my body feels like she was just assaulted. And so, yeah, I just want to share that experience because I'm sure there's other people out there that have had experiences like that. And I just hope that you feel seen. I hope that you know that, yeah, that's, that's not okay. And that our system is broken in that way. And what I really took from that experience is like, no matter how fast everybody else is moving, 
I get to still move at my own pace and I get to say, stop. We're going to all pause for a second while I have a moment to freak out (laughs) about what you're about to do. And you're going to tell me everything you're going to do. And then I'm going to give my consent for you to enter my body. Like it, it doesn't, it's not that like wild of a request, you know, and just to remind us all that we have the authority over our own bodies and that there's something that we need in a space like that, that you have hundred percent permission to make whatever request you need. And if that request isn't respected, you know what, you can also just put your clothes on and get the hell out of there. Well, first off, thank you for sharing that. But so much of the times it's like we get into that situation and we don't want to make a fuss or be difficult. It's like, so we just stay. It's like, oh, I can, I can stuff this down. I can, I can figure my way out through this. Um, But yeah, like you get to get up in the middle and be like, I don't like your care. I don't like how you talk to me. Like I'm out. (laughs) Like you don't have to really put up with that if you don't want to. There are amazing practitioners out there. And so um, regardless of what you think our perspective is of the Western medicine from this conversation, like there are many amazing practitioners out there, but that's the importance of interviewing them, going to different consults and really getting that feel for each individual person that's going to be giving you that care. But, um, when you were sharing your story, Erin, that's where I a hundred percent kind of came back to like, yeah, that's where they're desensitized and that's where they're in emergency medicine because like as soon as it's like oh we found it rush we immediately rush into the process it's just like here's the path and like here's where we got to go and and you're just like getting bustled along and and I think what's something that's interesting that we haven't brought up this entire time is the aspect of informed consent and we think of consent predominantly with sex Um, and our bodies from that angle, but we don't really think of consent in the medical aspect. Again, we think we got to go in, and as soon as I'm in the door, I have to do whatever it is that they say or recommend, and truly informed consent is giving you the benefits, and it's giving you the non-benefits or here's what you might experience as a symptom um, or a side effect from this decision. You know, you can say something safe and effective all day long, but just telling me it's safe and effective is not truly informed consent. Telling me all of the long list of side effects, once you tell me that, you tell me the ingredients, you tell me the benefits, then I have the information needed to make truly informed consent. You just telling me this this is the way and this is why most people do it um, is not allowing me informed consent. You have to tell me the flip side of the coin. Is there anything else that you'd like to share or say before we wrap up? Breathe. Uh, Because when we breathe, That's one of the first ways that we can connect to our body in a conscious way. Um, And there's so many times when we're in these situations where our stress response is activated and that gets us into that chaos state where we feel disempowered and where we have to give our power away. And so when you can be in those scenarios where you can have that internal pause, regardless of how much chaos is going on around you, that's how you're going to be able to find that grounded state to advocate for yourself. So and say, just breathe, slow down, connect with the body, connect with your truth and what feels right for you and what doesn't. And if something doesn't, Hey, you know what? They're working for you. (laughs) So get the hell out of there. (laughs) Preach. (laughs) Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Um, I really, I'm going to put Samantha's Instagram in, in the show notes. That's where this conversation sparked from because she was talking about self-advocacy in Western medicine. And it, and I just thought, gosh, this is such an important topic and conversation. And I feel like this is a way to not only just like express my frustration with the Western medical system, but in a way of like, here's something that we can do about it. You know, here's a way that we can interact with the system that we have, but remember to bring our power, our power into the, into the situation. So anyways, I really recommend checking out her Instagram and yeah, just appreciate you bringing your wisdom and your experiences and just honoring you for everything that you've been through so that you can share, you know, your light and your wisdom with everybody and your little 15 year old who was like, 
nope <laughs> not doing it <laughs> all right that ain't for me i love so it funny. Thank you for space and inviting me on to have it i so appreciate you my pleasure all right guys well i'll put all our information in the link below our instagrams uh, my youtube channel in case you're listening on the podcast and all our other ways that you can connect with us if you'd like thank you so much for listening remember to give a thumbs up if you like this video and you want to see more from me and if you enjoyed my conversation with samantha be sure to check out the podcast episode eight where i talked to her about her journey with herbs and plants and essential oils and non-toxic living and all those other delicious things all the goodies <laughs> yeah okay bye everyone <laughs>